Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Rita Ulrich, and I'll be your host this night. I'm a member of the Wild Ones Board of Directors and I'm Board Secretary. I joined Wild Ones in 2015 with the Twin Cities chapter. We are excited to welcome you to tonight's online program, Native Plants for Stormwater with Eric Fuselet. This webinar is being hosted on YouTube Live. You're welcome to use the chat feature during the presentation. If you'd like to hide the chat box, please enter the full screen mode. The links referenced in tonight's presentation can be found in the description below. We did have a lot of questions submitted during registration and we will try to get to as many of those as we can during a Q&A session following Eric's presentation. Closed captioning is available and can be turned on in your settings. This program is being recorded and will be posted on our website and social media channels. We'll be also, also be sending a link uh, to participants so you'll be able to uh, use it that way. If you do have a technical issue tonight during the presentation, please email support at wildones.org. For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we're a membership organization devoted to promoting native plants and sustainable landscaping. We carry out our mission through educational programs at the national level, such as the Wild Ones Journal, Native Garden Designs, Seeds for Education grants, and webinars like this one. At the local level, Wild Ones chapters offer programs including garden tours, speakers, conferences, plant sales, and seed exchanges, among other things. We currently have 69 chapters and 22 seedlings in 27 states. If you look at the map, the darker markers are chapters and the lighter green markers are seedlings. If you're not a Wild Ones member, we hope you join us and take advantage of the camaraderie and support that you, can, that you will experience being part of a chapter. Wild Ones chapters are where members get their hands dirty and learn by doing. Many of our young seedlings are active, actively recruiting chapter officers and planning this year's activities. And even many established chapters offer a wealth of volunteer opportunities. So there are lots of ways to get involved. You can amplify the impact you have as part of the native plant movement by sharing your skills and passion with others. Please reach out to your local chapter to find out how you can be involved. If there isn't a chapter near you, think about starting a seedling in your area. Get in touch with us and we can help you connect with others in your area also interested in starting a chapter. Programs like tonight's webinar would not be possible without the generous support from all of you. Please consider donating to Wild Ones today. We work to inspire and empower individuals and communities across the country to transform landscapes into vibrant, an essential habitat for birds, bees, bats, butterflies, and all wildlife, including us. Join us in our mission to raise awareness of the fundamental role that native plants play in addressing our most critical environmental issues by providing educational opportunities to learn how. Tonight's presentation with Eric Fuseli is the first in our three-part green infrastructure series. The series was developed as a follow-up to Eric's initial presentation on this topic in December. Tonight, Eric will go more in depth on how phytoremediation can be used to improve stormwater quality and cover a wider range of native plant species and contaminants, including arsenic, chlorinated solvents, sediment, and nutrient pollution. Eric Fuseli is an environmental scientist at Olson, an engineering and design firm, and he's based out of their Fayetteville, Arkansas office. He conducts environmental impact studies and works with civil engineers and landscape architects to minimize the environmental impact of the infrastructure projects they design. Eric is a member of the Wild Ones National Board, and he also chartered Wild Ones Ozark chapter, where he continues to serve as chapter president. So let's get on with it and learn how native plants and phytoremediation can improve stormwater quality. Eric, can you turn on your video and unmute yourself, please? Yes, thank you, Rita. 
Let me share my screen here. Appreciate that introduction. Okay, how are we looking? You're looking good. All right, thank you. Take it away. All right, well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to, again, talk about two topics that are near and dear to my heart, phytoremediation and native plants. You know, there's, um, what I find is, you know, a lot of the focus as people have become more aware of the environmental plights that uh, we're dealing with, you know, there is a lot of well-deserved focus on how we can use native plants to improve habitat for pollinators, wildlife, and whatnot. Uh, but, you know, I, I feel like there's a, still a part that's missing uh, that I would like to help increase awareness of uh, things that native plants can be done or can be used for uh, as far as improving environmental quality. So I had a great time uh, providing that webinar back in December, but, you know, it's such a broad topic, it's hard to squeeze it all into one hour. So I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, come back and kind of provide this series of webinars where we're going to look a little more in depth, but also uh, broaden um, the focus a little bit uh, on each topic. So, uh, you know, talk about stormwater, where I've added a few contaminants that we didn't get to cover the first time. And I've also thrown in uh, additional species that uh, in each of these webinars um, for each of these contaminants. Uh, so that way, um, you know, wherever you're located in the United States, you can maybe start jotting down the note. Maybe you want to consider uh, some of these species in a, a project that you have coming up, whether that be in, um, you know, in your own yard or uh, maybe you're a municipal planner or landscape architect or something like that. So, um, so I, I start off with this slide broadening our focus because not only are we broadening our focus here for the topic, but I'd also like to uh, see us as a community broaden our focus and uh, how we are looking at uh, native plants and how we can use these and thoughtfully place them on the landscape. Okay, let me uh, make some adjustments here. All right, so, um, you know, I had this slide, I thought, you know, it really represents the idea that, you know, this really isn't our grandparents' world uh, that we live in anymore. You know, we, we live in a very different world than we had, you know, several hundred years ago. Uh, there are many aspects that were much worse a hundred years ago than they are today due to, you know, environmental regulations have really done a lot to improve environmental quality. Uh, but that's not to say that we don't still have uh, common issues that we're still dealing with. So, um, you know, and I think we're not always aware of the very low to moderate levels of environmental contamination that do exist in the environment. Uh, they, you know, they're not on levels to cause large scale ecological catastrophe that would like make the news. You know, there aren't, you know, always these large fish kills that are happening, but there are uh, these, you know, whether that be just little chemicals uh, here and there in our stormwater that have this cumulative effect over time as we're exposed to these. And we don't always know uh, what the uh, health impacts are going to be until much later in life. And even then, it can be hard sometimes to trace it back to anything specific. So um, I think, you know, just recognizing that, uh, I think there's just a lot more that we could be doing uh, with our um, native plants and how we design our native plant gardens and whatnot. So um, moving forward. Oop. All right, so phytotechnology. What is phytotechnology? If you didn't have an opportunity to view uh, the webinar I gave back in December, I'm going to cover a few of the concepts uh, from that webinar, but some of it I'll kind of glaze over because I'm going to kind of assume that, you know, you, you at least had a chance to view it. But if not, I'll at least cover uh, enough of it for you to be able to understand the concepts that we discuss here today. So phytotechnology is uh, using plant-based methods um, for remediating or containing environmental contaminants in soil, sediment, groundwater, or surface water. And this is kind of a large umbrella, can include quite a few uh, different things, not just uh, remediation, uh, which is part of phytotechnology, is phytoremediation, but, you know, other things as well, erosion control, uh, basically using plants as tools or being thoughtful on how we uh, place these plants on the landscape uh, and be able to maybe use these plants in place of uh, other tools that maybe are, have a less a biological component or more abiotic. I always prefer to see a well-vegetated stream bank versus one that's just, you know, covered with riprap. So and that's one thing I try to, whenever we can here in my work, uh, use native plants for stream bank stabilization as opposed to riprap. 
So when we're talking about storm water, which is the focus of our uh, topic today, you know, there's a few different things that we can, um, different types of design techniques that we can incorporate native plants into. And this is just kind of a preliminary list. I'll, I'll discuss a few others as we go through the presentation, but just to kind of get you thinking um, of, you know, how we might use native plants. And, you know, some of these can even be applied on our own home landscape. So think of if you live near a road or impervious surface, or think about what's around your home or what's around the area where you might have a project and what might be migrating uh, to these areas in the stormwater as it flows across the impervious surfaces. So anything from rain gardens to bioswells, uh, detention ponds that collect uh, stormwater from say a neighborhood. Uh, around here when uh, where I live, we, you know, they drain all the neighborhoods into, you know, a regional detention pond. And so uh, some of these detention ponds that we design here at Olson, we um, I'll select native plant species to go in these that uh, can help remediate some of the uh, herbicides or pesticides and what, uh, what else might be, you know, in, contained in that stormwater, uh, you know, uh, petroleum products, that sort of thing. Anything that's flowing off somebody's yard or uh, flowing off of a, a street or driveway. So like I mentioned, just kind of consider your surrounding land uses. Uh, what, what's your neighbor doing? Maybe you're not uh, having somebody come out and spray for termites at your place, but maybe your neighbor is. Uh, maybe they have somebody come out and spray for ants. So what are, what are people doing, whether they be upstream of you, up gradient, if you're say live on a slope or your project's on the slope. And I have upwind, but that's really gonna more apply to next week's presentation on air quality. So when we select species, we want to make sure that we're selecting species that will be a tolerant to those low to moderate levels of contaminant that will be uh, migrating to that the site where we are planting these plants. So the contaminants I'm going to cover here, uh, some of these you'll see uh, were covered uh, last December, but then I've added a few extra ones as well. So petroleum products, pesticides, chlorinated solvents, uh, sediment and erosion, you know, it's going to be a little more on the phytotechnological side than the phytoremediation, uh, nutrient pollution, and then arsenic, which is kind of a, um, I'll have a little caveat on the arsenic. The, the research there is pretty nascent, uh, so it's still research needs to be done. So I want uh, anything I say when we get to that to kind of be taken with a grain of salt, uh, because there's still, I think, um, additional research that's needed. Uh, to show that the, the species that we'll cover uh, will be truly effective. But uh, there is some research to suggest that there are some uh, ways that we can help remediate arsenic contamination in water. All right, so petroleum products. What are some sources of petroleum uh, in the environment? I mean, this could be anything from fuel spills and leaks, uh, leaking underground storage tanks, automotive repair shops, uh, these leaking underground storage tanks, otherwise known as LUS. Um, if they, a lot of gas stations uh, all have these underground storage tanks, of course, where they keep their gasoline and diesel. And these things are typically only designed to last, you know, 30, 40, you know, years at most, sometimes 50. You're, you know, squeezing a little bit extra time out of it. So a lot of older gas stations, what I run into um, are uh, have leaks. They develop leaks and they're required to do monitoring um, your local DEQ probably um, has like an inspection process. And so once they just start, you know, finding water and whatnot that's leaking into the gas tank, that's usually a good sign that it's corroded away. And then, you know, water's getting in, then it's a good chance that fuel is getting out. So uh, that's not uncommon, especially in urban environments. And so then the next step is to figure out, well, how large is that underground uh, plume? And then how can it be remediated? So uh, easier categories of petroleum to degrade, and that's really what we're going to focus mostly on here with stormwater. Uh, these easier uh, to degrade categories like gasoline, diesel fuel, MTBE, uh, BTEX, um, like the benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. Uh, these are much lighter. Uh, they can mobilize more easily in stormwater and groundwater. There's also more of a concern with these getting down into groundwater than the heavier or harder to grade. Um, petroleum categories. So um, also something to keep in mind, especially with gasoline, diesel fuel, typically if this is spilled on the ground, uh, it will tend to evaporate in time. Um, so it, um, still an issue, but do keep that in mind as well. Uh, these are, do volatilize, uh, uh, eventually will, within you know, a short period of time, will eventually 
evaporate into the atmosphere. But when we were used looking at diesel and gasoline fuel, uh, phytovolatilization is going to be uh, part of how we uh, can use plants to uh, remediate these. Like I said, I mean, typically it's going to all evaporate before the plant has much of a chance to do anything with it. Other aliphatic hydro hydrocarbons, we're going to look more towards phytodegradation, phytovolatilization, and phytostimulation. And just to kind of review from the first presentation, I go a little bit more in depth into each of these in the first one, but to kind of give a little bit of a review, what is phytodegradation? And these are when we're using the plants um, to degrade the pollutants and then incorporate those um, components that it's been degraded into, into the plant's tissue as nutrients. So the plant could either uh, through exudates from the roots, um, those exudates will react with the uh, pollutant or contaminant, cause it to have a reaction and break down, and then the plant can take it up. Or other times, uh, that plant is able to take in that pollutant or contaminant, and then from there, break it down through its metabolic processes. And so once it's able to break that down into less harmful components, uh, it can either be incorporated into plant tissue, or other times it will be transpired uh, through the plant uh, leaves into the atmosphere where that um, level of contamination is much more diluted to where it's not as much of a health concern in the atmosphere as opposed to when it's more concentrated in the soil. So when we're looking at phytodegradation, uh, we want to consider high biomass species. Uh, these are fast growing species that we're going to be able to take up and store contaminants faster and in larger amounts than the average species. Phytostimulation, uh, this is when we're relying more on microbial activity to break down uh, the contaminants, but that microbial activity is stimulated by the presence of the plant roots uh, and the exudates that those plants, uh, plant roots excrete. Uh, so these microbes live in what's called the rhizosphere. Uh, this is the area around uh, the surface of the root or the rootlet. And so uh, they're kind of living off those exudates. And so when that microbial activity is stimulated, uh, you get a lot of species of microbes that can use some of these contaminants as um, food sources. Think about um, hydrocarbons. That's a carbon, uh, often a carbon chain. Uh, and so, you know, carbon-based uh, organisms can use some of these. Uh, they can break it down, can, uh, use it as food. It's toxic to us, but it's food for some of these microorganisms. Um, this helps break it down um, and then it's uh, in a less toxic component, at least to us and other wildlife. Now, when we're looking at phytostimulation, since we want uh, there to be roots and more of a rhizosphere in the soil, we wanna choose roots uh, that are A, deep, and also very fibrous. Uh, I mean, look at this picture here of some of our native prairie plants. These perennial native prairie plants have these deep fibrous root systems. And the benefit behind that is a greater area of soil um, underneath that plant is taken up by the rhizosphere uh, as compared to a plant where it might have thicker, larger root systems. So with a greater volume of soil taken up by the rhizosphere, you get a greater rate of microbial activity that is breaking down these contaminants and hydrocarbons, and um, which is, makes the uh, phytoremediation of these contaminants go by much quicker. All right, so what about phytovolatilization? This refers to the absorption of a contaminant by a plant from the soil through its roots, uh, followed by the release of that contaminant or in modified form um, into the atmosphere via transpiration. Uh, this is often coupled with phytodegradation. Uh, it can also be coupled with other forms of phytoremediation, uh, phytohydraulics, whatnot. Uh, but yeah, so kind of went over this a little bit ago but just kind of recap on that. So when we're considering plant species for uh, phytovolatilization, it's important that these have high evapotranspiration rates. So hop species with high evapotranspiration rates are gonna be able to move more water from the soil to the atmosphere, um, and they're gonna be better suited to capture contaminants mobilized in water, stormwater or groundwater. All right, so as far as MTBE, uh, with these kind of molecules, we would tend to use phytodegradation or phytovolatilization. And with the BTEX, uh, benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene, 
uh, you can use phytodegradation, volatilization, or phytostimulation. So plants uh, for easier to degrade petroleum categories are going to inc also include trees with long roots that can access that groundwater. Like I mentioned, these are lighter components. Uh, these easier to grade uh, types of petroleum are lighter, more mobile, and they're more likely to reach that groundwater uh, and be mobile within the groundwater. So having uh, deep rooted plants, especially trees with these long roots, uh, to access that groundwater is also going to be important, especially if we're wanting to use phytovolatilization. Now, I mentioned there's also harder to degrade petroleum, and we'll touch on this very briefly, but I'm mostly going to leave a lot of this for our the presentation in a couple of weeks and soil contamination, because since these are heavier uh, types of petroleum, they're much less mo mobile and tend to bind to soils. So this is going to be much better for a talk on uh, remediating soil contaminants. So these would include polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, coal tar, crude oil, heating oil, these types of things. All right, so if we want to uh, have design techniques uh, to help remediate any of these lighter uh, forms of petroleum that might be contained in stormwater runoff, um, some common ones would include stormwater filters, rain gardens, bioswells, or even constructed wetlands. Uh, a regional detention pond could also be considered a constructed wetland uh, if it's designed and planted as, as such. So if we want to place these things in locations that receive st uh, stormwater from roadsides, parking lots, gas stations, machine repair shops, uh, these are the kind of locations where you're going to see more of these lighter uh, forms of petroleum uh, contained that are more the sources of these lighter uh, forms of petroleum in our stormwater. Uh, techniques for groundwater, uh, you can have an interception hedgerow, uh, groundwater mitigation tree stand, uh, or even use phyto irrigation. Uh, that's going to be where you have to irrigate that water from the groundwater uh, into a, an irrigation system where you have above surface uh, irrigation system where you have uh, certain species planted to um, improve uh, that, that groundwater. Uh, that's going to be more if you have a, you know more extensive contamination or more, more of a concern, um, not so much um, for like a suburban or urban use like you know planting. This is more for projects where there's some issues with uh, groundwater contamination and you need to have a much more extensive project to uh, help remediate that. Now, I said I'd briefly touch on the heavier categories and I'm really going to only mention how it might apply to stormwater wastewater and leave the rest of that discussion uh, in soil contamination for the third part in this series. And so uh, with sedimentation basins or tanks, uh, you can use this to capture these heavier uh, petroleum ca uh, categories where they might be bound to certain particulates like sediment and washed off into there, but then you'll have to have a secondary type treatment system to then treat that contaminated sediment. So uh, either haul that somewhere, excavate it and haul it to, uh, and have it treated off site or uh, once it's all there, depending on the, how much contamination you have there, uh, you might be able to treat it on site. All right, so let's get into some species for these lighter petroleum categories. Uh, switchgrass is a great one. Indian grass. And now when I mentioned total petroleum hydrocarbons, this covers a wide range of different types of petroleum categories. Some of them hard to degrade, some of them easy. Uh, so this is mostly just referring to the ones uh, within that, um, that broad umbrella that would be uh, lighter and easier to degrade. But there is some overlap in the species that can um, degrade each. Side oats grandma. Western wheatgrass. And you'll also notice I include the range maps from BONAP, uh, which is a great website, bonap.org, the Biota of North America program. Uh, you can get on there and uh, type, uh, find a species and see where that species uh, has been recorded, where its native range is and all that sort of stuff to see if something is native to your area. They have county level distribution maps, which we see here. So the light green is where it's been recorded in that county. Um, you know, if it's been recorded in a state, they end up coloring the entire state a darker green. Buffalo grass. 
one of our native stoloniferous grasses, a great substitute for Bermuda grass if you live uh, in the Great Plains. Eastern gamma grass, nodding bulrush, green bulrush, tussock sedge, broadleaf cattail, arrowhead. Now notice that a little bit more teal green color, California, um, that's to indicate that it's adventive uh, in the state of California. Canada goldenrod. You can do a wide range of uh, petroleum, lighter petroleum categories from diesel range organics, uh, BTEX, aniline, phenol, and MTBE. Black willow. You know, it's a phreatophyte. Those roots go down into the groundwater, which makes it ideal. Narrow leaf willow. Sandbar willow. Honey locust. Not as great of a tree for landscaping with those gnarly thorns, but maybe there are some areas that uh, maybe you want to discourage people from going to, uh, but this would be a good one. Eastern red cedar, burr oak, has that really large acorn. Willow oak, leaves look less oaky, kind of willow-like, but it has an acorn. Black locust, eastern cottonwood. Again, one of those that's able to remediate a wide range of different categories. Loblolly pine. A lot of the places uh, I've worked at down in um, East Texas, Northwest Louisiana, uh, they have a lot of pine, loblolly pine silviculture, and they're also extracting a lot of petroleum from the ground. Uh, it's you know, like a dual land use in a lot of these places. Common hackberry. All right, so moving on to pesticides. The phytotechnological processes that we would use uh, with pesticides are gonna include phytodegradation and phytostimulation. Uh, so certain plant species are able to uh, break down certain pesticides outside their root systems, take them up, uh, metabolize them. Other times they're uh, stimulating microbial activity in order to um, break down these pesticides in the soil um, into non-harmful components. So, you know, we see pesticides used in a lot of different uses. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of the ones that were used a long time ago are much, much worse. Uh, they've done a lot of research on uh, trying to improve uh, pesticides let me, to be less persistent. Uh, if anyone's read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, that was a, a very important book uh, in, um, changing a lot of attitudes when it comes to pesticides. So, uh, but we, we do still do see them use uh, quite a bit. Uh, and so uh, sometimes people aren't always using them correctly. Uh, sometimes they are broadcast spraying. Sometimes they're doing it a um, little too close uh, to water. Uh, other times they're doing it, um, you know, right before rain. So, you know, there's, you know, just because they're um, you know, not everybody follows the directions. Not everybody is doing things wisely. So uh, locations that receive um, stormwater from residential areas, agricultural fields, um, especially historic uh, agricultural fields, which might have used uh, pesticides that were from a, a, a time before that were much more persistent. Uh, orchards, rail corridors, utility corridors. Uh, this photo here that you see in the background I took here in Northwest Arkansas, usually around August utility companies go and uh, spray their corridors and I understand, you know, they want to keep woody vegetation down that might uh, become issues with their power lines. Um, and so it's just, um, you know, you don't, uh, I would like to think that most companies are going to be responsible in how they use it, but I've seen this happen uh, right by a creek. So uh, where allegedly they're not supposed to be uh, spraying that close to. So big blue stem. Um, 
shown to be able to break down a variety of different uh, pesticides, such as atrazine, which is widely used herbicide used primarily in agriculture, um, uh, chloropyrifos or chloropyrifos, I might be uh, mispronouncing that, is an insecticide uh, used primarily to control uh, foliage and soil-borne insect pests. Uh, pendimethalin is a selective herbicide used to control broadleaf weeds and grassy weed species in a number of crop and non-crop areas, as well as residential lawns and ornamentals. And uh, propiconazole is a fungicide used agriculturally on turf grass, grown for seed, um, and various other um, aesthetic or um, agricultural products like wheat, mushrooms, uh, sorghum, oats, pecans, a uh, wide variety of different agricultural products. Uh, switchgrass, atrazine and pendimethalin. Indian grass, shown to be able to degrade atrazine and pendimethalin. Eastern gamma grass, shown to be able to degrade uh, anthracene, chlorpyrifos, chlorothalonil. Uh, pendimethalin and propiconazole, broadleaf cattail, atrazine, has a wide range across most of uh, North America. Common rush, shown to be able to break down anthracene. It is considered exotic in uh, certain locations in Colorado, but otherwise native uh, in most of the Western and Eastern United States. Black willow, Shown to be able to uh, facilitate the breakdown of bentazone, which is an herbicide used to control annual uh, plants. It's highly soluble in water, uh, volatile, uh, and very mobile, and also has may present a risk to leaching into groundwater. So again, uh, black willow being a phreatophyte or a plant that uh, gets most of its water from the groundwater, its roots get, uh, go very deep. Uh, and, you know, what typically it's grows in locations where um, the groundwater is close to the surface, uh, but I have seen it grow in other locations where it might have to reach uh, a little bit for that. River birch, bentazone, which is a selective herbicide used on lawns, turf, as well as agriculturally on rice, corn, soybeans, uh, alfalfa, beans, other crops. Eastern cottonwood, Shown to be able to break down alacor, which is an herbicide used for weed control on corn, soybeans, sorghum, peanuts, and beans, as well as dioxane, another herbicide, and atrazine. Um, Metalachlor is an herbicide used in agricultural for grass, broadleaf weed control in corn, soybeans, peanuts, sorghum, and cotton. Red mulberry with anthracene. All right. So moving on to chlorinated solvents uh, and stormwater, these aren't going to be as uh, concerning since they do tend to evaporate, but I have seen areas where there was so much of it in stormwater uh, that there was a lot of soil contamination, um, especially around historic dry cleaners. Now, currently, uh, dry cleaners are supposed to, when they keep their uh, chlorinated solvents, whether it be TCE or PCE, they have the secondary containment system around these uh, that way, if there's uh, some sort of spill in the primary containment system, that there's that secondary containment to um, prevent it from getting into the environment. But I have seen historic dry cleaners, even in the area I live in, where they um, did not have a secondary containment system. And so uh, back in you know the 70s, 80s, uh, whenever this was, uh, anytime it would rain, uh, they kept the oak top to their primary containment system open. And so uh, it would fill up with water and then it was, it would overflow. It was leaking all these for many years, all these uh, chlorinated solvents around it. Um, and so there was extensive soil contamination. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot more of these type situations than we may be aware of until they're found. Uh, other sources of chlorinated solvents are cleaners, greasers, uh, rocket propellants. It's not un uncommon to find these, uh, this type of contamination around uh, military bases also used as refrigerants and fire retardants. Some examples, like I mentioned, TCE or trichloroethylene, uh, perchloroethylene, PCE. Uh, trichloroethylene is a solvent used in dry cleaning, rubber production, and for degreasing metal parts during the manufacturing process. Uh, it's also found in some consumer products like wood finishes, adhesives, paint removers, and stain removers. 
also PCP, uh, pentachlorophenol, uh, vinyl chloride, and chloroform. Now, when it comes to TCE, uh, if we need to look at how to remediate that, we're going to be looking at phytovolatilization, phytostimulation, and phytodegradation. Uh, the same with PCE, uh, but with the other types of chlorinated solvents, uh, phytovolatilization is going to be um, the, the technique that we would need to use. Potential applications, like I mentioned, uh, it's generally in uh, low enough amounts. It's not um, as it does not remain in stormwater very long as it tends to evaporate pretty quickly. Uh, but in large enough amounts, um, places like uh, dry cleaners, industrial sites, rail maintenance yards, auto body shops, and defense sites could be sources of these contaminants in uh, the stormwater. So what are some techniques? Well, interception hedgerow, hedgerows, groundwater mitigation, tree stands, and again, with phytoirrigation, very similar to uh, what we would do with groundwater um, contamination with the lighter components of uh, petroleum. So what are some species uh, for this? Well, American sweet gum for TCE and vinyl chloride. Gamble oak for TCE. Tulip tree for TCE and vinyl chloride. Eastern white pine for TCE, PCE, and vinyl chloride. Eastern cottonwood for TCE, PCE, and PCP. And PCP is an industrial wood preservative used mainly to treat utility poles and cross arms on uh, railways, stuff like that. Eastern redbud. Also, vinyl chloride uh, can be formed in the environment when soil organism, uh, organisms break down other chlorinated solvents as well. So it's, sometimes it's that byproduct of uh, the breakdown of chlorinated solvents in the environment. Uh, typically in the environment, the highest levels of vinyl chloride are found in uh, air around the factories producing vinyl products. Silver maple. American sycamore. River birch, pin oak, live oak, black willow, narrow leaf willow, blue stem goldenrod, elm leafed goldenrod. Hairy goldenrod, stiff goldenrod, eastern gamma grass, clustered field sedge, meadow barley. All right, so what about sediment and erosion? So we consider soil a non-renewable natural resource. Uh, and the reason we consider it non-renewable is it can take over 500 years to create one inch of topsoil. Um, you know, when we have a lot of erosion, you know, you lose your topsoil, uh, it's not coming back anytime soon. It can also take 3,000 years to accumulate enough substances to make soil fertile. So, um, you know, soil is a livelihood for a lot of people. Uh, and we depend on soil to uh, grow our food. Uh, we depend on soil to uh, build our buildings and whatnot, uh, our houses, that sort of thing. So um, we need to take care of our soil. It's a, you know, I hesitate to call it a living organism, but it is definitely a living system. Um, and so if we don't treat it well, uh, we don't prevent erosion, then um, it's going to be uh, outside of our lifetimes before it cuts back to uh, the level that we, we had it when we arrived on this planet. So uh, sediment and erosion in water makes it difficult for aquatic plants to conduct photosynthesis. Uh, when the turbidity, which is the measure of suspended sediment in water, uh, when the turbidity is too high, uh, then that prevents uh, light uh, from being able to really penetrate the water column. And so the algae that are in the water uh, that use that or use that light to photosynthesize, uh, well, what's a byproduct of photosynthesis? Oxygen, right? Uh, well, so these algae, they're respiring oxygen into the water and that's the dissolved oxygen content 
that uh, many um, aquatic animals uh, rely on in order to breathe, whether it be fish, macroinvertebrates. Uh, so, you know, for light for a healthy aquatic ecosystem to be able to thrive, light has to be able to penetrate the water column. Uh, and so the algae can uh, provide the oxygen to help support these aquatic ecosystems. So when we have too much sediment in our aquatic ecosystems, it makes it much more difficult. Uh, also, uh, sediment can get lodged into fish gills, uh, which can cause them to suffocate that way as well. So potential sources of sediment in our waterways include eroding stream banks, construction sites where maybe they don't have the BMPs installed properly. Uh, BMP stands for best management practices. Uh, each construction site is required to, uh, especially if it's a large enough site, uh, have a what's called a stormwater pollution prevention plan uh, to make sure that when a heavy rain comes, maybe when they aren't there working, that that sediment is contained on site and doesn't uh, end up polluting our local waterways. Also, agricultural fields after, you know, a till, uh, you know, that soil has been tilled up and loosened up and if you get a heavy enough rain, it can start to transport that soil off of the field uh, and into the local streams. Uh, dirt roads are another source of uh, sediment in our waterways, especially if you in rural areas. Uh, one of our impaired streams here in the northwest part of Arkansas uh, is impaired due to turbidity. And one of those sources, uh, major sources of the turbidity, was determined to be all the dirt roads within the watershed because uh, it's within uh, what's known as the Boston Mountains, part of the Ozarks. And so all these dirt roads and steep slopes, when you get a heavy rain, it starts to transport that soil off the dirt roads and goes downhill into the streams. So when we're selecting plant species uh, to help prevent erosion, we need to, especially if you're going to have things um, on a low-lying uh, river riparian area, you want to make sure that they can handle periodic inundation. You know, some species are going to handle that better than others, and some riparian areas are going to become inundated more often than others. Sometimes stream banks, if they're high enough, might only be inundated during a 100-year or 500-year flood. Uh, some stream banks that are low enough might uh, experience that inundation more frequently. Also want to point out that uh, a lot of the species that grow here, uh, native uh, and several non-native or many non-native uh, that are, have been naturalized out in the environment, have a what's called a wetland indicator status assigned to those species. Uh, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers maintains this list. Uh, they, uh, if you want to know what the wetland indicator status is for a particular species, uh, you can go to either U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is a website uh, they have where they maintain it, or you can go to plants.usda.gov, uh, type in uh, the species, and that'll bring you to another site where you can click on a tab called wetland, and then it will tell you what the wetland indicator status is for the region, uh, regions that it's found in. There are several there are regions all over the country. Uh, here in the Ozarks, I'm you know, located in what's called the uh, Eastern Mountain and Piedmont region, uh, which covers uh, the, the Appalachians and a lot of the interior highlands, the Ozarks and Ouachita Mountains of Arkansas, and Missouri. Um, but there's also another region would be, say, the Great Plains, uh, the Atlantic Gulf Coastal Plain, uh, the Midwest. Uh, so it's important to know what region you live in and to see what the wetland indicator status is for that species and the region either you live in or uh, where your project is located. And so um, wetter species like cattails, button bush, these are rated as OBL or obligate wetland plants. Uh, these tend to exist on the landscape at or just above the low water mark. So they like areas that stay pretty wet. Uh, maybe during the driest months of the year, that water level gets low enough to where they're just basically sitting on a mud flat. Uh, one step uh, out from that is the facultative wetland species or FACW. And they like to live at or just above the average water mark. So uh, throughout most of the year, uh, they have moist soil, but they can handle, uh, you know, some periodic temporary uh, water levels going down and maybe the soil might, you know, dry up for a short period of time. Uh, one step out from that are going to be your facultative species. Uh, these like to sit at or, or just above the, the, the high water mark. So uh, they usually occupy the transition zone between wetlands and uplands. Um, and so they can handle this. Uh, you know, if you have a stream bank that's pretty high uh, and it's maybe only going to experience flooding uh, during these high water events, uh, then facultative species 
are probably going to do much better. The spring, stream bank's pretty low. Uh, like I show in this picture here, you're probably going to want to stick with obligate or facultative wetland species. But notice how all that vegetation here, um, as that creek floods, and this is taken uh, from a photo right here uh, in the northwest part of Arkansas, in Bentonville, Arkansas. And, you know, this is right after a heavy flood event. And you can see how the, the vegetation's all been pushed over one way. Well, what that vegetation helps do is it helps slow down a lot of that storm water, helps spread it out, um, helps it give it more time to soak in, uh, prevents it from, um, during these flashier floods, of uh, having more damage downstream. So these riparian areas are very important for helping um, mitigate a lot of our storm water flow during these heavy rain events. And then, of course, outside of uh, the high water mark, you get your facultative upland species, and uh, you're generally called uh, upland species, UPL. Uh, and those are, you know, they like to sit in drier areas uh, most of the time. They don't handle uh, uh, even the high water as well. So again, think about the root structure and lifespan of the plant. Uh, deeper roots are going to hold the soil in place better than shallow roots. So if you're wanting to... Um, stabilize a stream bank or plant along a stream bank. Uh, fibrous roots are going to hold a greater volume of soil in place. And then perennials often have deeper roots and live longer than our annuals and biannuals. So having these species uh, for riparian plantings are going to be uh, much better than shallower rooted uh, species and annuals. Uh, here's an example photo I found on the internet of a eroded stream bank and uh, I'm not seeing very many uh, deeply rooted plants in this soil uh, growing there. It looks like just some turf grass. And so you can see how it's pretty much just soil uh, with some shallow roots and maybe the top, you know, few inches of soil. So if you, uh, depending on uh, if that stream's kind of coming around a bank and hitting against that bank right there pretty hard, it's just going to break apart that soil over time, especially during um, heavy rain events. All right, so fast growing species that produce dense foliage and a high quantity of biomass are definitely going to be able to contain sediment on site. So if you say you're planting around an agricultural field or planting along the edge of a stream, you're trying to just whatever sediment might be coming into it. Um, if you think about the above ground component as well. The below ground component is important uh, for the root systems. The above ground component is going to help. Uh, capture any sediment or reduce the amount of sediment entering the stream. So not just holding the soil that's there in place, but make sure any soil that's coming along and stormwater runoff uh, is able to be um, captured. Uh, it's going to be um, better facilitated by these uh, dense, high biomass, fast growing, dense foliage uh, type plants. So again, this is that same stream I showed you earlier in Bentonville. I uh, just want you to, I thought this was a great example of these plants doing their job uh, and helping um, mitigate that, a, a big flashy flood that we had last year, spring of last year. Um, I mean, it was a 500, if not a thousand year flood. It was a bad one around here. One of the worst we've had. All right, big blue stem. This is going to be a great one for uh, sediment and erosion control. Little blue stem. And I would encourage you to look up the wetland indicator status for these species in the region where you want to plant them to make sure that you're planting them appropriately on the landscape uh, in relation to a water body. Switchgrass, Indian grass, many of our native warm season grasses uh, have these dense underground root systems and produce a lot of this uh, above ground biomass. Prairie cordgrass, blue gramma, Side oats grandma, Canada wild rye. It's one of our native cool season grasses. All right, so riparian buffers along the edges of streams, edges of lakes and ponds. If you're trying to prevent uh, water or sediment, I'm sorry, uh, sediment and stormwater from getting into your pond. Uh, I've seen a lot of agricultural ponds that over time they just get silted in. Uh, and just basically, the, you know, it turns them into little shallow wetlands, honestly, uh, which they have their own ecological value um, as, you know, functioning as former farm ponds, but current wetlands. But um, I know um, over time, uh, farmers might want to prevent their ponds from silting in, especially if they're trying to provide water for their cattle and whatnot. 
using these species in conjunction with stormwater BMPs at construction sites. Uh, that's going to be a little more difficult uh, just because generally the time that they're using construction, um, they're constructing something is going to be uh, a less time than what you have to grow these species. But if you have a large enough construction site or maybe a particularly uh, sensitive water body um, next to this construction site, um, I just would, you know, never hurts. Uh, adjacent to agricultural fields, like I said, uh, these freshly tilled fields are, um, can be a source of sediment in our waterways. All right, so nutrient pollution. All right, so what's, what's bad about nutrient pollution in waters? Well, excess nutrients can lead to an overgrowth of algae. Uh, well, uh, why is that bad, right? We want, you know, we want some algae in our water to produce the dissolved oxygen that aquatic ecosystems and fish and uh, microinvertebrates need to live. Well, when you have too much algae, uh, which we call a eutrophic environment, uh, not only does it reduce the amount of sunlight entering the water, but it can also harm aquatic ecosystems because when that algae eventually dies, the microorganisms that uh, consume the, the dead algae will also be consuming uh, the dissolved oxygen in that water and leading to what are called anoxic uh, zones or areas where uh, there is no dissolved or very little dissolved oxygen. So places like the Gulf of Mexico, where the Mississippi River uh, drains into, uh, by the time you get down uh, low in the Mississippi River, you know, around New Orleans, you got a lot of nutrients in that water. I mean, I think the Mississippi River drains most of North America, a lot of farm fields in North America, a lot of nutrients go into the various streams, the Ohio River, the Arkansas River, the um, Missouri River, and eventually um, down to New Orleans and down to the Gulf of Mexico. And each year they have these large uh, dead zones, uh, which has an impact on the fishing industry down there. Uh, because uh, you get a lot of these fish kills are areas where there are no fish because there's no oxygen in the water for them to breathe uh, because of what's called eutrophication. That's where you get too many nutrients um, and that goes through that whole process that ends up depleting the oxygen in the water. Sources of nutrient pollution can include sediment from erosion, especially when we're talking about uh, phosphorus. Uh, leaves from grass clippings. A lot of people don't think of these grass clippings as potential pollutants, but uh, when people clip their grass uh, or mow or whatever, and they just leave it in the streets, well, these get washed in, uh, to storm drains. And then, then when they end up in aquatic ecosystems, uh, they break down and they contribute nutrients uh, to that aquatic ecosystem. Also, fertilizer and pest waste uh, can be another source of uh, uh, excess nutrients and aquatic ecosystems, especially fertilizer that's applied too soon before rain, uh, pet waste, you know, uh, contributes nitrogen and whatnot. So what are the phytotechnological processes uh, for nutrients like nitrogen? Well, phytometabolism, this is where we're gonna rely on plants to be taking up these nutrients and incorporate into their biomass. Also phytovolatilization, um, the microorganisms in the soil uh, are stimulated by the exudates from plant roots. And this can help denitrifying bacteria in the soils convert nitrogen into gas. So uh, when we have, um, if we're trying to remediate or trying to improve um, a water body or, uh, or even wastewater that has uh, too much nitrogen, uh, these are two of the uh, techniques that we can employ. Well, with phosphorus, uh, we're gonna use phytometabolism and what's known as phytostabilization. Uh, phosphorus can't be converted into gas like nitrogen can uh, with the phytovolatilization. Uh, so uh, that one phytovolatilization is not really an option. And also studies have shown uh, that uh, when it comes to extracting phosphorus uh, through phyto extraction or phytometabolism, you can only extract around 30 pounds of phosphorus per acre, which often isn't uh, as effective of a mean. So really phytostabilization is going to be our go-to technique uh, for phosphorus. What is phytostabilization? Well, generally, uh, this is a, a technique where we use plant species <clears throat> to immobilize contaminants in the soil and groundwater, whether that be through the absorption and accumulation uh, by the plant roots, uh, adsorption of the contaminant onto the roots, or precipitation within the root zone. And we'll uh, explore this concept a little more whenever we get to uh, some of the heavy metals in the third installment in this series. So phosphorus contamination in water can take a couple of different forms. 
Um, it can be as to sediment um, or it can be or dissolved soluble phosphorus in the water itself. So when we have phosphorus uh, binded to uh, sediment, uh, that typically can be filtered and physically removed uh, by being passed through a vegetated system. Uh, but then, you know, in that case, the sediment will eventually need to be dug out. But when we're dealing with uh, dissolved or soluble phosphorus in the water, um, uh, this is removed from the water uh, when it comes into contact with the, uh, the soil and it's absorbed onto the um, surface of the soil. So when it's bound to these soils, it's stabilized on site. Uh, so um, that uh, results in phytostabilization. Uh, herbaceous species that have both high growth bio rates and uh, produce high biomass can be effective if we're trying to filter phosphorus through them or reduce or remediate phosphorus, uh, whether it be S sediment, uh, these, these are going to be ideal. Uh, also, uh, for uh, phosphorus and um, nitrogen, uh, like I mentioned, some of these uh, other plant species are going to be uh, helpful when it comes to phytometabolism. So plants with these high growth rates are going to be taking up uh, these plants uh, and using these nutrients uh, and creating uh, biomass out of them. So everything from box elders, uh, red maples, black willows. These have all been shown to be effective in helping remediate uh, some of these uh, nutrient contamination, eastern cottonwood, black elderberry, bald cypress, American vetch, red fescue, common rush, big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass, Indian grass, prairie cord grass. Potential applications for these species, again, riparian buffers, edges of lakes and ponds, vegetated filter strips, uh, constructed wetlands, edges of agricultural fields where uh, fertilizers are being applied. Uh, these are all going to be effective ways to help uh, improve water quality and prevent uh, excess nutrients from having the impact on aquatic ecosystems uh, that we often see in these locations. All right, now final category, arsenic. Uh, and again, the caveat here is the science is still pretty new on this, so take it with a grain of salt, but I would at least like to introduce this uh, potential idea. Um, Arsenic health impacts uh, of having arsenic uh, in the environment can include uh, skin damage, uh, nausea and vomiting, problems with, uh, with your circulatory system, uh, cancer, and even death if exposure is too high. Sources of ar arsenic in stormwater include uh, from the earth's crust. It is uh, pretty much found everywhere um, in, this, in the soil. Um, also treated lumber. A lot of our... Um, trying to think there's a certain kind of treated lumber that uh, still uses arsenic for the most part. A lot of the stuff that's used in homes uh, no longer contains the arsenic, but there is some uh, other forms. Um, and then you might still have like railroad ties and older treated lumber sitting around a property that might be contributing arsenic to uh, the soil. And so when you get a heavy rain, uh, this is going to pick up the soil um, from the, you know, um, around these locations, uh, telephone poles, stuff like that, um, and transport it into the water. Now, we can choose to select arsenic accumulator and hyperaccumulator species. Um, the science is kind of looking into this to see whether or not, um, and there has been some hopeful studies out, but uh, there needs to be more replication. Um, so, um, but we'll get more into uh, accumulator and hyperaccumulators when we talk about the heavy metals in the third installment. Uh, but for now, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, it in relation to arsenic. Now, uh, phytostabilization and phytoextraction are going to be the two main uh, phytotechnological processes that we might use um, in a study. Uh, this isn't probably ready to be applied in field use, but um, if you're going to employ a study, um, this is the two different techniques you would typically use, especially phytoextraction. 
Uh, this refers to the absorption and uptake by plants of large amounts of an element. Uh, heavy metals is often used with heavy metal contamination. Uh, these, you know, which are inorganic contaminants, they can't be broken down any further. These are the inorganic contaminants or the um, elements on the periodic table. Uh, so when we can't break these down in the soil or in the plant, we have to extract them. Uh, these ex um, contaminants are then translocated into the above ground parts of the plant. Uh, but if you're dealing with herbaceous species, you have to then remove the, the above ground component um, and then haul it somewhere to dispose of in a safer way if you want to remove that contaminant from the site. Uh, if you just leave it there, well, the, it's going to uh, contribute that uh, contaminant to the surface of the soil when the plant dies or goes dormant. But there are some species that are promising uh, for being able to accumulate uh, and remediate uh, arsenic contamination, such as common sunflower, floating primrose willow, one of our Ludwigia species, rice cutgrass, uh, a really bad, uh, I won't say bad maybe, but if you run into this one in a wetland, uh, be careful. because it, It's called cut grass because those leaves can cut you open. They're, they're sharp. Eastern gamma grass, broadleaf cattail, common rush, marsh fern, side oats grandma, spike bent grass, eastern cottonwood, red mulberry. All right. So the, the main point I want to make here is there's still untapped potential with many of our native plants. Um, I don't believe that they're currently being utilized at their fullest potential when we select these for our native gardens and landscapes. Uh, you know, our landscapes can contribute to more uh, environmental improvements beyond the benefits they provide, I believe, to uh, pollinators and wildlife, not to take anything away from the benefits uh, and the focus that we have on providing uh, benefits to pollinators and wildlife. But, um, you know, that's equally important. I still uh, plant for pollinators and wildlife on my own property. Uh, but, you know, I do want to uh, just increase awareness on um, that, you know, there's still more, I think, that we can be using these species for. Um, and my hope is that in time, uh, it might be 20, 30 years, but, you know, a lot of us now are, you know, in the native plant community know which species is a host plant for this particular butterfly species or moth species. And I would love to see more native gardeners and landscapers become just as knowledgeable about which native plant species can be useful for remediating a specific contaminant that might be, um, you know, near or close to their home or um, in their city or in the, uh, the area where they might be selecting native plants for gardening and landscaping. So with that, I will end my presentation and hand it back over to Rita. Eric, thank you so much. I'm kind of blown away here. There's a lot of science there. There's, you're packed with information. And I know I, I really appreciate seeing all that. And I feel like I'm going to have to watch it a few more times to start absorbing more all the information that you provided. But I th um, thank you so much for your expertise and sharing your time with us as well. Certainly. Before we start the, the Q&A, I just want to note a link to our survey. We ask that you fill it out after tonight's presentation. Your feedback does help us improve webinars. And we will also be emailing the link to everyone who registered for tonight's webinar. If you found this presentation as informative as I did and also enlightening, you will probably want to see the remaining webinars in the Green Infrastructure Series with Eric. And it's coming up in a week from, from now on the 14th, we'll be seeing We'll be, uh, Eric will be talking about outdoor air quality and on the 21st, soil contamination. Now, let's take a few minutes to answer some of the questions that were submitted with the registrations. Eric, what plants are best for a rain garden absorbing roof runoff? 
Yeah, and that's where, you know, I think it's important to be aware of the uh, wetland indicator status uh, for a particular species and looking at, especially if you're just uh, accepting uh, stormwater runoff from a roof, uh, typically you're only going to have high water flows in that situation, um, or you're only going to be getting flows to that area uh, whenever there's a rain event. So, um, you know, facultative species and then the facultative wetland species um, or FACW are going to be better uh, in those types of locations uh, as far as down in the, um, the low area of a rain garden. Now, up around the berms of a rain garden, of course, you know, the facultative upland species and the upland UPL are going to be better. So uh, just don't, depending on the region uh, that you're in or that you're wanting to plant this rain garden, I would say, um, you know, go for those types of species and when you're considering placing them in your rain garden. Thank you, Eric. What plans will work for a small stormwater detention pond that usually has two to three feet of water and occasionally dries out? Now, something like that, that just occasionally dries out, you're going to want to be on the more wet side. So obligate wetland species, um, you know, and facultative wetland species are going to be better. So um, you know, cattails, um, you know, and be careful with cattails, they can hybridize. And so, and then take, and when they hybridize, they can take over an entire area, but other species that are more obligate wetland species, uh, like button bush, uh, if you're in a part of the country where button bush is native to, you know, um, if you're wanting some tree species, you know, um, uh, bald cypress, things like the, uh, these kind of species rely on those mud flats, uh, to germinate. So, um, when the water level goes down, you get that mud flat, um, you know, that those, you know, the seeds from these species are going to germinate. So these uh, are adapted to these kind of areas and then they can handle the inundation for the rest of the year. Hmm. Thank you. This is a great question. Uh, it's how do we test for contamination in water shooting down from hard surfaces? Can we do it ourselves or is a lab required for heavy metal contamination? I mean, I would recommend a lab if, um, and there's environmental testing labs all over the country. Um, you know, sometimes a university might be able to provide that service. Um, other times extension offices, at least here in Arkansas, they're really only going to tell you, you know, the, you know, if you have a soil testing lab or something like that, what, what's in your soil, uh, they're going to tell you the pH, the nutrient content. Uh, but when it comes to water, um, uh, if you type in, you go into Google, type in like environmental testing lab near me, uh, you can usually find one. Uh, you can submit a sample or two. Uh, they can analyze that and let you know uh, what's in there. Okay. Another person wrote, we are receiving intense downbursts of rain these days. What are the best plants to use in stormwater conveyances to slow down inf and infiltrate the immense am amount of water or at least not road away. Yeah, and that's where it's going to be important to have plants established. Uh, if you're trying to establish plants and then one of these intense rain events come along, it's going to, uh, it could potentially you know, wash the little seedlings away. So that, that's really where it's becoming challenging because we're having that here uh, in the part of the, uh, the country I live in in the spring, uh, really intense rains, and then it dries up for a lot of the summer. Uh, and that hasn't been um, typically what we've experienced, and it's not really what a lot of the uh, local plants are as adapted to. Um, but if you, you know, the concept with, you know, these intense rain events is to, you know, the saying is to slow down stormwater. Was it slow it down, spread it out, soak it in. Uh, so you might, uh, it might be, have more to do with the uh, design of the stormwater conveyance system to be able to handle these heavier rain events, uh, but provide a, you know, maybe a wider basin, uh, but plant that, um, so it's less concentrated. Uh, anything you can do to help, you know, slow down the water, let it spread out, give it more time to soak into the soil uh, is going to be beneficial. Uh, higher biomass uh, plant species are going to help with distributing, spreading out that water, slowing it down as well. Uh, but when you get these bursts, you know, sometimes that, um, you, while it will slow it down, um, eventually those can become overwhelmed as well. So but it's better than concrete channels that just shoots it right out of the urban area into the country and then at a road away, roads away farm fields and stuff. And has, you know, we got to think about the impact that we're having on people downstream. Uh, and I think a lot of times, um, especially with city planners, engineers, a lot of times they're more thinking about the city itself. And once it's outside of the city limits or outside of their project area, you know, not their problem, but it's somebody's problem. And so I think it's important to consider um, 
who, whose problem it might be and how we might prevent that. Absolutely agreed. Eventually, it's all of our problem. Exactly. So does information on stormwater apply to wetlands? I thought that was an interesting question. And it very much can, um, because, I mean, there are constructed wetlands that can be used uh, to help detain stormwater for these periods of time um, to help reduce flooding downstream and to give it more time to soak in. So you can have a constructed wetland that might, you know, depending on how, you know, where your city is and your watershed, there might be a point, um, you know, just outside um, of, of the city where it's an ideal place for a constructed wetland to hold uh, the, the, the stormwater coming off of the impervious surfaces from that urban area. Uh, it just, it's more, you know, area specific, uh, but that's a possibility. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, that wetland indicator status um, for the plant species, you know, a rain garden is basically like a tiny little, you know, constructed wetland, but you're going to, it's more in an upland area. So you're going to choose species that are more on that upland uh, side of um, those indicator statuses. So a larger wetland, of course, is going to, you're going to choose species that are more obligate or facultative wetland species. Yeah. And, and these are some similar uh, questions. We had quite a few that talked about managing runoff and controlling erosion. And you've addressed some of that. One person specifically asked about managing runoff from a parking lot that's near a forested area. Yeah, um, so a parking lot near a forested area. Um, I'm, I'm, my assumption is that the um, runoff leaves the parking lot and enters a forested area. Um, and so I would, you know, you typically in a forested area, if you, if, I mean, you already have a lot of plant species there that are, you know, are probably doing a good job. Um, I think the more concern there is, is it uh, causing erosion, is, you know, in which case you might need to uh, put in some sort of stormwater uh, control, like a rain garden, um, bioswell, something like that. Um, but, you know, uh, typically the type of contamination you find on a parking lot is going to be pretty low uh, to moderate. Uh, not really much of a concern environmentally. I'd be more concerned with uh, more concentrated uh, pollutants entering a forested area. Um, and I'd be more concerned with runoff from a parking lot entering an aquatic ecosystem than just entering um, an upland forest. So if that, you know, but then again, without knowing the specifics of that particular location, there might be some other nuances that I'm just not aware of. Uh, but generally speaking, that would be my thoughts. Any thoughts on controlling erosion after removing invasive buckthorn and um, hollyhocks along a riverbank? It's a good project, but it does create another problem, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, removing any, uh, even native species from, or any species from an area creates a gap, and that's, you know, more easily filled by these opportunistic species, which many invasives tend to be, you know, and part of that, um, you know, in the absence of just being there to make sure that anything that starts growing that you don't want there is removed, um, you know, putting some sort of nursery crop um, you know, a lot of times if you, even a non-native, say, uh, annual uh, rye, um, that's a cool season grass. But if you're, say, uh, plant it in the spring, you know, it will provide some temporary coverage, ground cover, um, to be a nursery crop for maybe some native seeds. Um, but then it'll burn right up uh, as soon as it warms up. It won't have that chance to go through its normal life cycle. Uh, whereas if you plant uh, cool season grass in the fall, if it's non-native, then um, then it's going to you know probably take over by spring because it has all of that winter to uh, go through its cool season grass uh, life cycle. Uh, so the time of planting is important. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, uh, putting down native seed or trying to replace it as soon as possible with something, um, you know, it's it's going to be site dependent. It's going to be season dependent. Uh, how you how you tackle that issue. But yeah, the issue, you know, I would say trying to get something established there uh, as soon as possible is going to be key. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question about absorbing runoff and contamination, and it's uh, what to do with rainwater from a golf course that runs into a ditch that's full of um, unplanted or, or volunteer chicory. Hmm. Yeah, um, you know, and chicory... 
I'm guessing this is, you know, a pretty ephemeral type ditch. It doesn't stay wet for very long, at least where I'm, I'm from, chicory is um, not, not as a wetland of a species. It tends to be uh, more of a roadside kind of species. Um, but, you know, a lot of the, uh, what you see on golf courses, I mean, those are really high input managed systems or, you know, they want that turf to look, you know, pristine for the golfers. You know, they, so they're treating that often with fungicides, you know, you know, insecticides, all kinds of things to make it look, uh, the way they want it. Uh, I would really highly recommend you check out, uh, what a local, golf course here in Arkansas did, uh, Ben Garen golf course in Fort Smith, Arkansas, uh, was built on, uh, what used to be historic Prairie. It was Massard Prairie, M-A-S-S-A-R-D, uh, the golf course manager, big proponent of native species. And what he did, uh, was, uh, he, uh, wanted to revert as convert as much of that, uh, golf course back to native Prairie as possible. So to how you end up finding that balance between the golfers and um, the, the, the wildlife in the prairie was he first started off by putting like this kind of red dye out on the, the, the golf course to figure out where golfers were hitting their balls. So, he, you know, we let people know at the, at the office that, hey, if your ball lands in this area where it's red, let us know. We don't want to convert something to prairie if golfers are going to have to be walking through it to retrieve their balls. And so through that, they found out the parts of the golf course where nobody was hitting their balls and nobody was having to go into. And they converted all those areas back to of prairie well it's been a big success and a huge uh boost for their budget because that's less areas they have to mow that's less areas they have to manage um you know the golf course managers are very happy you know the maintenance people are very happy and it's just been a win-win for everybody so uh he ended up winning an award uh, locally here uh, for his work and, um, and he gives great talks uh, on on that uh, and wants to encourage uh, golf course managers elsewhere because a lot of golf courses are built on historic prairies and so to me that's a great case study for how you can find that balance uh, at golf courses between uh, native restoration and and golfers that's brilliant i love that yep. so, um well i think we're going to end with this one and someone asked that um, they'd like to see a bibliography of suggested reading for uh, the range of depth. Uh, so for novices and more experienced uh, people with science backgrounds that address all three uh, aspects, the stormwater, air quality, and soil contamination. Yeah, and I think uh, we're going to be placing something like when we get the, the video posted to the website, uh, I'm going to provide a, a bibliography that they can post along with that and some links to some useful websites, um, you know, and I'm not aware of anything that just breaks it down to layperson's terms, uh, but there's stuff that if you, you know, if you read Doug Tallamy, you'd still understand it well enough. So if you read popular science books, you'd be able to understand it well enough. <laughs> but yeah, we'll, ha we'll have that out there for everyone. Yeah, I think that was a really good suggestion, and, and I'm sure that Wild Ones would be really um, pleased to have that Yep. Happy to help. Well, and, yeah. and it, oh, and I also want to let you know, if you'd like a copy of the slides, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you can re if you look on the Wild Ones website, get my Wild Ones email, which uh, I believe is at e -F -U -S -E -L -I -E F-U-S-E-L-I-E-R. But just go to the section that lists the board of directors, uh, find me, send me an email, and I'll be happy to send the slides from these presentations to you as well. Well, thanks, Eric. So, folks, if you found tonight's presentation as uh, fascinating as, as I did, then um, you'll probably want to check that out and uh, stay tuned for the next two webinars on the 14th and the 21st. Thank you again for joining us and have a terrific evening. Thank you, Rita. Thanks, Eric.